Okay, it looks like most of us are here, so we'll get started. Hi everyone, my name is Kelsey. I'm the Development Manager here at Travis Audubon. Thank you all so much for joining us for our first summer lunch series of the year. We're excited to be here together today. And before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items and announcements. So to get started, we're going to minimize distractions today by turning off all of our cameras and muting our microphones before we get started. Um, so if you have any questions for our speaker, you can submit your questions or comments to the chat box. We will have a brief Q&A session after the presentation where we'll read all of your questions to Cliff. A quick announcement from Travis Audubon is that our Purple Martin Roost has moved. So as you all might know, we are hosting our Purple Martin parties this July on Saturdays. Um, and as of this week, the Martins have moved from their Round Rock Roost to the Capitol Plaza parking lot in central Austin. So we are going to follow them. Our first Purple Martin party will be this Saturday at 7.45 p.m. at Capitol Plaza in central Austin. We'll continue practicing social distancing and more details are coming very soon. So watch your inbox for and our website for updates. Um, this is an ongoing situation and the Martins are just deciding where they're going now. So um, we'll have more details. For today, um, our speaker series with Cliff. Cliff Shackelford is a seventh generation Texan who began birding at the age of nine in the late 1970s. He has been the state ornithologist at the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department for over two decades. And for the last eight years, he's hosted a live radio show about birds on NPR's Red River Radio that covers much of East Texas and parts of three other states. In 2005, the book Hummingbirds of Texas that he co-authored was published by Texas A&M University Press. For a decade, starting in the late 90s, Cliff taught two really popular Travis Audubon courses when he lived here in Austin. They were the Warbler Workshop and Intermediate Birding. Today, he's tuning in with us from East Texas to tell us about how winter storms might affect our state's wildlife. Cliff, we're so excited to have you back in this new virtual format. Um, so thanks so much for joining us today. Great, thanks Kelsey for having me and I appreciate the invite. <clears throat> and I hope some of my old buddies from Travis Audubon are tuning in right now. So hello to all of you. So. Uh, well, let's jump right in. We're going to talk about the winter storm that impacted much of Texas back in mid-February. They even named it URI, um, and there was a lot of talk about dead birds. And so the question is, do winter storms like URI cause high mortality in our state's bird life? And if not, what does cause high mortality? So let's jump in. And the so slide is not advancing. Hmm. What could have changed? Hmm, I'm not That's sure. We just very practiced weird. this. Yep, it worked when we practiced, and now it's not. If you might just need to um, click on your PowerPoint again in PowerPoint. Well, I'd have to stop sharing to get out and get back in. Should I do that? Yeah, let's try it. Oh, wait, there it worked. Oh. I, did, I did something. Okay. So let's talk a little bit, a bit about finding a dead bird. It's just not easy on a normal day. It's not, it's even not very easy when the ground is blanketed with smooth white snow, um, as in this picture here. Uh, and I spent a lot of time during URI. We, we had three inches in Nacogdoches, and it stayed on the ground for five-ish days. We spent a lot of time going out, you know, bundling up, getting on our ski boots. We have all the ski equipment, um, and, and we got on our ski equipment, our heavy coats, and walking around. And you can see anything on a white surface like this. So I really scoured the neighborhood, um, and we walked a lot, and I only found two dead birds 
a goldfinch and a hermit thrush and the hermit thrush was up underneath someone's window so i couldn't rule out uh, when to kill on that one but it it's really tough to find dead birds um, so it's really hard to quantify whether storms make uh, an impact on our birds so birds are built for cold i mean you could go to duluth in the dead of winter um, go do a christmas count in duluth you'll find birds um, birds have things that help them combat the cold. They have feathers. Uh, think about what we do with down feathers. We make uh, clothing and pillows and, and warm comforters with those feathers. So feathers keep birds very warm. Uh, birds can create their own, uh, generate their own heat. They're endothermic. They can gather fat um, and collect it subcutaneously and use that fat later. Um, if, if food shortages are low, they, they can kind of uh, go into the cupboard, so to speak, and, and, and use those fat stores when needed. They can also adjust their metabolism while sleeping. Um, some birds, uh, especially some of the hummingbirds up in the high Andes, can slow their metabolism down and go, go into a state of torpor where they shut, almost shut down to where there's really not much uh, uh, going on, um, and they can save calories that way. Uh, birds also can find shelter to get out of the cold. Um, and then, of course, they can flee. They're able to migrate, and they can do, uh, you know, an impulse migration if needed to, to get out of cold weather. So this is a picture um, that if you've ever done bird banding, this is the typical stance of of how you hold a bird. Um, so we're looking at the, the breast and belly of a bird. So to your right where it says head, the head is between those two fingers and gently, uh, uh, those fingers are gently uh, around the neck. Um, the thumb on the far left is keeping the tail out of the way. And then uh, what, what people have learned to do is blow air and you can see um, the, where the fat stores are. Um, you can see the pointer there. I stole this off the internet. It's a very good picture. Um, so, and what's also neat is you can see that, <clears throat> that if you're not familiar with bird feathering, they're, they're not completely feathered every square inch. They, birds are feathered in what we call feather tracks, T-R-A-C-T-S. And um, so, so birds are not completely feathered from, you know, evenly feathered. They're, they're in patches. And so this, this allows people to see um, how birds can store fat and carry that with carry it with them. And, and in migration, a lot of our beloved warblers and shorebirds, they can almost double their, their weight by gaining a lot of fat um, in order to make big long migrations um, across oceans, across continents and so forth. So birds are built for cold. So the first thing I did um, after Yuri hit is I, I looked for published accounts in Texas on winter bird die-offs. And I, there was a lot on avian cholera and that's really prevalent in waterfowl, especially in times of drought when there's few water holes and sick birds are exposing everybody else in the few water holes that are holding water. Um, and, and it, so I excluded avian cholera and I, I didn't come up with a whole lot. Um, the, the master was, is, is Dr. Stan Casto, uh, a buddy of mine who published a couple of really neat papers on, on uh, the first one here is a historical perspective of a blizzard that hit in 1886. Of course, Stan did not experience that. He, he's uh, basically an ornithological historian um, and he's retired from uh, University of Mary Hardin Baylor. And I still keep up with Stan, he's, he's a great guy. So uh, what we'll do, these are numbered and we're gonna go through them really quick to give you an idea of what is in the literature. Uh, Cause that's the first thing you wanna do is, is okay, Yuri hit, how common is this? Does this happen a lot? You, you know, if you're 20 years old, 30 years old, you may have never seen anything like that. Uh, but that's where the historical record can really help. So let's jump in. These are again are numbered and let's go through one, one at a time real quick. So the first paper that Stan did um, on the blizzard of 1886, there was a lot of really neat information. That storm was about 135 years ago. Um, the, some of the temperatures were given in that paper. You can see them on the screen. 
Um, Paris, Texas got down to negative eight, San Antonio five degrees. Several rivers froze over, including the Bosque, Brazos, Concho, Llano, and Red River. Uh, there was ice formed on the Rio Grande or Eagle Pass, and it was reported that people ice skated on the Brazos River in Waco during this blizzard. So that was pretty significant. And look at Galveston Bay. Um, it got, it, it froze up to an inch and a half in, in, the, in the entire bay. So various songbirds and waterfowl were found dead across the state. And uh, in 1886, people weren't really adept at identifying birds. They pretty much knew their, their ducks and their geese, maybe even just called them that. They didn't differentiate which kind of duck or which goose. But you, you don't have the ability, a lot of these authors didn't have the ability to identify uh, these birds. So when I say various songbirds, that's all they wrote. They didn't quantify by species what they found. Um, and they didn't do a very good job quantifying, period. They just said they found dead birds and uh, various parts of state. Um, also, livestock on farms were found dead during this 1886 storm, namely cattle, pigs, and chickens. That was before people made chicken coops. So a lot of these uh, livestock were just left out in the cold and didn't have shelter. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that many of them perished. The second paper by Dr. Casto he did was on winter mortality of cave swallows in South Texas. And this was a regional cold front. And it happened in January of 97, where temperatures got down to 29 to 34 degrees, pretty steady for six days in the northern parts of South Texas. And he, he discovered 102 dead cave swallows found underneath several bridges between San Antonio and Catula. Um, and you write these down if you want to look these up and, and read, read more about them on your own. The third article, most people might be familiar with the name Arthur A. Allen. He was reportedly the first ornithologist at a, uh, as a professor in a college setting in the country. He was at base at Cornell. He was the one who was involved in the ivory build search. He was the major professor of James Tanner, who did the seminal work on ivory builds in the 1930s in the Singer Tract in Northeast Louisiana. So Arthur Allen wrote a chapter in a book, um, a book called Discovery that was edited by John Terrace. And, and Allen wrote about how the marshes um, overnight uh, froze in Galveston Bay where he was on the night of January 31st, 1925. And he was um, there to collect birds. He was, a, he was hunting ducks and he all of a sudden noticed that ducks became unbe unbelievably scarce. That was his quote. So I, I speculate, and he probably did too, that probably these birds probably vacated the area um, and got out of there because of the extreme weather. And that's another, again, another beauty in birds. They can get out if they need to. The fourth article is one that I really like because I, I lived it, I felt it, I saw it, I breathed it. Um, it's uh, some of you on the call um, or on the webinar might remember that we had some cold temperatures in central Texas um, in early October of 2000 that um, occurred and, and blasted through the central plains and stayed ahead of a lot of shore, uh, swallows that, has, that hadn't migrated south yet. So the, these birds basically couldn't get ahead of the storm. And so for probably four or five days, they were migrating behind the storm. There was nothing to eat. Um, and by the time they got to Austin and Waco, there was this line, this long line of, of um, not literally line, but there was definitely a, a part of the latitude in Texas where uh, it was just the end of the gas tank for a lot of swallows, namely barn and cliff swallows. And, and, and some of you might remember at Horns of Ben, there was just lots of them out there. Um, so that was pretty interesting. And again, this, this was um, birds that couldn't get up in, in front of the storm. They couldn't feed. And birds in general can probably carry three, four, five maybe days of fat reserves, but um, they, they're they not gonna make it a week without feeding, so. Um, and then the last one is a bonus. Bonus because it's not Texas. And bonus because it was right next door. The Associated Press News in New Mexico next door to us. And recently during the pandemic um, in December, 2020, 
a lot of you remember uh, uh, that there was a super early and record-breaking cold front in, in early September. And lots of dead birds, 305 dead birds were picked up. There were probably other areas um, in that general vicinity where there were dead birds that just went undetected. They were mostly insectivorous birds like swallows, warblers, and flycatchers. And they were like the, the 2000 event, they were caught off guard. They, they weren't able to fatten up before winter weather hit. So um, the, the dead birds were found, they were severely emaciated. There was evidence of starvation, including empty stomachs, depleted fat deposits, shrunken breast muscles and, the, and that power their wings. And also birds can absorb their own organs when they need to. So that, that's an, one way to save yourself before fully dying of starvation is to start absorbing organs that you don't really need. And some birds do that annual, annually, like the black pole warbler that we're familiar with. And in the fall, they make this tremendous migration out of the Northeast US and cross the uh, Atlantic going south to South America. And they double their weight and they can even absorb uh, certain organs that that they don't need just to just to save weight and 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 use that absorption for energy. So that's the history that I came up with. There might be other papers that you know you'd have to dig a little deeper or maybe even go into the newspapers. And that's really a good thing about Dr. Casto's work. He dives into old newspapers, um, and that's where he got a lot of his information, especially for that 1886 blizzard. So here we are in 2021, and we're all reeling from the, the storm, Yuri, and, and staff are calling each other, hey, are you okay? Do you have power? How, is your water working? And of course, people are starting to see dead birds. So an a, a employee at Parks and Wildlife, Jonah Evans, he's our state mammalogist at the time, he he started an iNaturalist project and he got some help from some other folks at Parks and Wildlife to quickly get this going. The, the URI had already been, oh, a week or two old, I think, by the time they got it going. But the, the, this is um, crowdsourcing, citizen science, where you, you basically tell people, hey, if you found a dead bird during URI, let us hear about it and, and we can gather that up. So. I'm going to be presenting the results of what was submitted to this iNaturalist project. And it's really pretty cool, R really interesting. It's something that we couldn't have done five or 10 years ago. So um, it's one of those technological advances where um, we can really get people out there to share what they've seen. And if they don't know what it is, they can send a, a photograph and, and we can help them identify it. And so kudos to Jonah, kudos to iNaturalist. It, it's a really great uh, project where I dug in and, and I'll present those data here in a minute. Um, before I start, I, I'm gonna also include information from this document by Rosenberg et al. It's a 2016 Partners in Flight Con Land Bird Conservation Plan. And in this plan, it's very useful, very helpful there are population change and population estimates that um, I'm gonna show that basically tell us, okay, we lost some birds, but this species, how, how's it doing overall um, in, the, in North America? Um, and so that, that really puts things into perspective and you'll hopefully see that here in a minute. Um, so those data are generated from uh, nearly half a century of breeding bird survey data um, that's, that are available that the USGS um, uh, coordinates. So you'll see M, M is in millions, of course, in, in, in the next few slides. So the, the, the number one bird found dead was Eastern Bluebird. And there were 92 uh, uh, observations submitted across the state during URI that we can attribute to, um, to death from the cold weather. But look at the population change in the last 50 years of, of Eastern bluebirds across North America. You, you won't find another bird that's done this well, a, a plus 178% increase. And 
that can be attributed to the push in bluebird boxes and having bluebird trails and bluebird landowners and people are fanatic about bluebirds and that's great. So people put up a lot of boxes starting probably got really accelerated in the 70s and 80s and that really helped um, get this population increase that we see. The estimate is about 20 million individuals across North America and the thing is many people found their dead bluebirds inside their boxes. So social media and, and you know all these bluebird societies, they and landlords, they started talking to each other and said, hey, go out, check your bluebird boxes um, because bluebirds are known to roost, especially in cold weather inside their box. It makes sense. You can stay warm in, in a box. So sure enough, it was very detectable because, you know, again, it's hard to find a dead bird on the ground, but when you're going to check your bluebird boxes and you, you can really find stuff really easily. So that I think attributes to why we had so many bluebird detections, why it was number one. So sadly, people found frozen bluebirds in their box. Um, and then bluebirds are, are known to roost communal, communally in a, inside one single cavity. So during warm, uh, during cold nights in order to keep warm. This is a picture that you can see on the internet that was snapped and I've count at least nine bills beaks in this picture. Um, and so that's, that's a good way to keep warm, except look at what, how thin the box is on the left that, that we're putting out. Um, it's like going out in Yuri in a short sleeve t-shirt. Um, you're not gonna survive. So before people put up uh, bluebird boxes, bluebirds used old abandoned woodpecker cavities or a limb rot like you see here on the right. And you have a lot more insulation on every side of the natural cavity versus the thin t-shirt box on the left. So I suspect that the birds that, that were roosting in natural cavities fared a lot better uh, because they had way more insulation. They were basically in a warmer setting like having a big parka coat on. Uh, number two species was American robin. There were 88 observations. Um, berries in my yard, we have, we had the holly tree and the, the berries froze and got nasty within 24 hours. So, um, and also robins like um, the open ground they didn't like that blanketing of snow. We had a couple of areas at our home where the eve of our house kept the snow off and, and there'd be maybe a 12 inch um, perimeter around the house of bare ground. And boy, the robins were fighting over that. Um, and so were the white-throated sparrows. And a, a really cool thing we had in Nacogdoches with, with Yuri was we had an invasion of fox sparrows and in my yard alone, we had um, nearly 30 fox sparrows. We had, we've never had a fox sparrow in our yard. So these were desperate birds, probably, you know, I don't even know how far away they, they came to, to feed, but I can't find a fox sparrow within close distance of my house. So I think these birds were uh, made an adjustment based on the weather. Um, I queried about 15 other people with feeders in, in NAC, and I even visited some of their yards went while walking around, because um, some of them lived just a couple blocks away. And, and I think 12 or 13, I don't have my notes, 12 or 13 of those 15 folks also got their first fox sparrow, uh, thanks to Yuri. Um, so that was pretty, that was probably the exciting, the most exciting thing that came out of Yuri for me was uh, this invasion. I'd never heard of an invasion of fox sparrows, so it was really cool. Um, but look at the population change. Robins are doing pretty well. They're up 8%. They have the highest numbers in, the, in North America. There's an estimated 300 million individual robins, and, and that shouldn't surprise anybody that travels throughout the 50, lower 48 states and Canada, everywhere you go, you can find robins, um, especially in the warmer months. So it's the most abundant land bird in North America. It's number one in number. So um, then yellow rump warbler, 71 
observations, the, their population change is, is zero, so it's stable. Um, its estimate is 150 million individuals. It's the most abundant warbler of about 49 species that occur in North America. So with let's go back to those pluses that think about that plus 178 for the bluebird, the plus eight. You have you have birds to give. I hate to put it that way. And, and a financial advisor gets it. They know that when you're dumping money into plans and you lose a little bit here, you lose a bit. You can you can give and take. Um, so, but we're going to get into a few species here that um, didn't really have much to give, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. This is one of the two. Morning dove was number four. There are 50 uh, folks that found dead ones. Um, their population estimate is 130 million, but but a, a slight, well, pretty good decline in morning doves in the last 50 years. So this is one of the two that took a hit from, from URI using this INAT data. Uh, number, the fifth most abundant bird found was white-winged dove. Uh, they've had a population change of 48% of an increase in the last 40, 50 years. If you live in Austin, you did not have white-winged doves. If you went to UT in, like, let's say, 1980 to 84 as an undergrad, there were no white-winged doves. So if you're a transplant, you think white-winged doves are just everywhere and they've always been there, they were not there pre-mid 80s. Uh, they, they are a recent expansion from the South and they've exploded. They've even occurred um, as far away as Canada and that didn't happen until recently. So we had plenty of white winged doves to give up. Here's the one that got hurt, hurt the most and, and most people, including myself, are concerned about is the sixth most abundant bird found is just the pine siskin. There were 38 observations in INAT. Look at the decline. There's been a population decline looking at breeding bird survey data over the last 40 to 50 years, a negative 80% very steep decline in pine siskins. So we don't have pine sis siskins to give up. So this is this was hard hit. Uh, population estimate is 35 million. The interesting thing is that a lot of people are finding dead siskins even long after Yuri into February and March and early April. And there was something else going on at feeders. Pro well, feeders were probably um, where, where things were spreading. So the big message with, um, if you wanna do something for pine siskins, it's okay to feed, but you've gotta keep your feeders clean. And if you see a sickly bird, um, you can go online and look. Uh, there are lots of videos of people walking up to sickly siskins all over Texas in February, March, and April, and uh, you could pick them up. They, they were sick. Um, there's not a general consensus on what happened. There, the Salmonella is a suspect, but there's really not enough information to tell us what was going on with siskins. So, Again, keep your feeders clean. Um, look at it on the right. You can see what happens when birds hang out feeders. They poop on it. And if you're, uh, if you're a sick bird, you're going to spread it, uh, your poo and your saliva to healthy birds. So our feeders and our bird baths can be uh, artificial concentrations of birds and can really spread illness. So the message here is keep your feeders and your bird baths clean all the time, not just with Yuri. Number seven, cedar waxwings. We all love cedar waxwings, but look, uh, positive 15%. I'm sorry, we've got some cedar waxwings we can give up. That's a way to look at it. That's a positive way to look at it. Um, yellow belly sapsucker, another one, a plus 46% increase in the last 40 to 50 years in North America. So we've got lots of sapsuckers. Chipping sparrow, um, there's some. Uh, inconsistency with the data. So the population change hasn't been determined for chipping sparrow through the PIF, the Partners in Flight Lambert plan. But when you have 210 million individuals and you're tied with blue gray gnat catcher as the second most abundant species of bird in North America, you, you're probably stable or increasing. There's no way you're, you're on the decline. So I have a, a strong feeling that that population change is zero or positive. Um, again, remember uh, number two bird in this list was American Robin, which is the number one bird 
in the country as far as individuals and population estimate. So again, this chipping sparrow is tied with blue gray gnat catcher is the second most abundant species across North America. So I'm gonna jump down, let's see, what was that? Number nine, I'm gonna skip a few, jump to, to Phoebe, because I really like our backyard Phoebes. They disappeared with Yuri, but a 29% increase. We've got some, some Phoebe surplus, so I'm not too concerned about it. I think a lot of these birds will rebound. Certainly Eastern bluebirds are gonna rebound. Um, you might not even notice a change. Uh, maybe some birds, you know, depending on your latitude, bluebirds are checking out nesting spots in, in mid-February and late February when, when Yuri hit and when there was maybe lasting impacts of Yuri. So I think maybe some birds didn't breed um, but that didn't mean they died. Maybe some moved on. But I think if you if you have a local lack of certain birds like bluebird, I, I don't think you're going to spend more than a year or two before you see their return. Um, so that, that's trying to be positive here. So with um, social media, we had a lot of people contacting Parks and Wildlife about what they can do. They, they didn't like hearing about the the sickly and dead siskins at feeders. So they asked, hey, can we vaccinate birds or add seed to the met medicine to the seed? No, we just don't do that. Should we keep our feeders full? And the answer is yes, but look at how many birds were in that top list I just presented that are insectivorous. Um, and that's something that's very difficult to supply. If you are a big mealworm provider, um, i I don't do it, but I can bet that mealworms froze solid within minutes um, uh, if you put stuff out when it was that cold, certainly within hours. So it's really tough to provide insectivorous birds with uh, food at feeders. Um, and then the bluebird comment, you know, uh, about the, the, the thin walls and, and, and uh, but remember it, it increased 178%. So I like to say what giveth can also taketh away. So people have asked, well, what about we insulate for winter our bluebird boxes? Well, how often are these winter storms happening versus in the summer, there's more of an issue of birds cooking in, in their bluebird box. So you, you, you'll, you'll see those folks that put heat shields um, on their bluebird boxes to keep it cooler because that's happening every summer in tech, hot Texas and, and can be cooking those eggs and those young. Um, but if you wanna winterize your bluebird box, I don't know what to tell you. Um, you might have a, a, a pretty good project to work on to figure that one out. So let's look at a few other weather related events that negatively impact birds that happen way more often in Texas than storms like Yuri. Um, hurricanes, uh, we all know about, that can be devastating for birds. Um, uh, Hur Hurricane Harvey that dumped so much rain was really a problem on the recovery of, of, of Atwater's prairie chicken. We lost a lot of prairie chickens due to, to Harvey with you know, 50, 50 inches of rain in some parts, 30 inches of, uh, in other, others. But when you're a ground dwelling bird and you're walking around and there's a foot of water or, or even several inches of water on the ground for days and days, that's a problem. Um, for ground ground dwelling birds like quail and prey chickens and others. Uh, there are all kinds of wind events that we don't even think about that are, are detrimental to birds. You know, a big one is um, bald eagle nests. Um, they, the bald eagles build this heavy stick nest up in the top of a, usually a super dominant canopy tree species that is, is the nest is acting like a wind sail. And so, the average life of a bald eagle nest is about four or five years because wind usually comes along at some point and, and knocks the nest down. Um, excessive rains during the breeding season, think about what I just said with Hurricane Harvey. Um, and if you're a ground nesting bird, um, that can be a big problem. Um, and then drought is a big one. And I, I call that the double whammy because you have the drought one year and you don't have food. Well, you also don't have plant growth for the next year. So it can usually drought can it emit as a, at a minimum give you two bad years um, because plants aren't able to keep up because of the drought in the first year. The second year usually can show 
a, a problem unless there's some, of course, rain kicks in, but, but drought's a big one. And we, you know, again, it's hard to find dead birds, hard to quantify these events as, as being detrimental to our birds. Hopefully most of you were uh, privy to this article that came out in the journal Science in 2019, it talked about uh, uh, the decline in North American birds it used uh, a lot of the same data that I presented that's in the Partners in Flight Plan using USGS BBS data. And they, they quantified it and they looked through all the birds and, and that, this was authored by Rosenberg et al., the same guy who authored the land bird plan from 2016. And he uh, determined that there were nearly 3 billion birds lost in North America from 1970 to the present. So there's a lot of things going on. We can't think that winter storms are even in the top and they aren't. So let's talk about what kills birds. Um, this I got off the internet um, from David Sibley's site and it's really good. It, it really points out what the, the two big killers of birds are. And, and it's, it's our cats that are running freely and it's windows and, and birds striking them. Striking them in um, any time of the year, they, you know, birds see the reflection of, of the sky and the clouds and the trees and they can't figure out that that's not the case, that it's really a reflection. They, you know, birds have a pea-sized brain, cut them, cut them some slack. So birds fly into windows, it's, it's a real big problem in migration when there's inclement weather and um, we have high rises that are all lit up um, in our downtowns and those, those lights can act as a beacon, a reference point for birds that are disoriented in, in a windstorm or rainstorm when it's you know that kind of weather where the pilot is taking the plane down and getting out of it. Um, so this can happen a lot and this, these are big killers for, for birds. And so if you wanna help birds, we're gonna wrap up here. If you wanna help birds and you're worried about Yuri, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. You have plenty of other things you can think about that kills birds every day of the year. Yuri might not happen for a long time, another Yuri. Um, so here, here are three things you can do. A, uh, back to what I said about siskins and, and keeping your feeders and your bird baths clean. B, keep your cats indoor. There's an estimate in the US of 90 million owned cats and another 60 to 100 million estimated unowned cats roaming freely in the US. You, do, you see my superscript there where I get my data. I'm not making these numbers up. You can look at my sources below. Um, and then there's an estimate of 2.4 billion birds killed by cats every year in the US. So keeping your cats indoors, huge. Um, C, reducing window strikes. Uh, there's an estimate of nearly a million birds, a million birds killed every year by windows in the US. And you can see my source there at the bottom. And then I will leave you with this. These are the two biggies. Um, and the third one is cleaning your feeders, but keeping your cats inside and windows. The picture on the right comes from Toronto and it's from many nights of uh, in, a, in spring migration of monitoring the, the below high rise buildings uh, during storms when birds got disoriented. You can see on that table, there are way more birds than, than what was uh, submitted to INAT um, in this presentation. So um, check your windows. There's lots of things you can do. If, you're, if you have a window that's repeatedly struck by birds, there are plenty of good websites that can help. I, I recommend the American Bird Conservancy's website, um, and they have a page on all these different options you can do to reduce bird strikes. The, there's a copian bird, uh, bird, uh, bird savers. There's kaleidoscopes film, there's all kinds of stuff. That does, it's not gonna break the bank, but what's happening in the picture here on, on your right is breaking the bank for birds. And I will stop there. And I think we have time for questions, I hope. Yeah, thank you so much, Cliff. Um, and especially thanks for all of this knowledge. I know it can be hard to think about or talk about birds dying, but it's really nice to have experts like you to guide us in our in our efforts 
and our wish is to help them. So um, we do have a couple questions. So the okay. first one, at the beginning of this presentation, you had a, shied, a slide of, I think, five like historical storms. Could you look back on that slide and remind us on the months that those storms happened? I think they were all winter storms. Yeah, they were winter. Uh, here it is. If you want to use your cell phone and take a picture of the screen might be the quickest and easiest way to do it. So these are all winter related. That's what I looked for. I didn't look for other bird events, uh, death events. So this was winter and again, um, there was a lot of avian cholera papers, mainly on waterfowl. I didn't include that. I was more interested in um, what was related to songbirds and, and the cold weather. So um, is it, does that answer the question? I think it does. Thank okay. you. Uh -huh. I'll leave that up so people can write or take a picture. Great. Um, okay, then we have another question. And if there are other questions, please just feel free to add them to the chat now. But our next question is, can we expect to have any beneficial changes to bird populations because of the cooler, wetter weather we've had this summer? Not, not if you're a desert bird. Um, not if the plant community you depend on doesn't jive with the changes that are happening. Um, you know, golden cheek warbler is a familiar bird to many of us on the call. It's a hill country specialist. It breeds nowhere else but in the hill country. That, um, um, but you know the the outlook is that you know the the forest community could dry up and do the opposite of what the question was, and things get hotter and drier, and those oaks and um, other trees uh, could go away, um, and that would be super detrimental on a relic species like the golden cheek warbler. Okay, um, we've got another question. Uh, and I think this is regarding the winter storm, Yuri. How did roadrunners fare? The colony in my local South Austin park appears to have been decimated. Yeah, I, we didn't get any submissions on roadrunners um, in, in, the, in the INAT database. Uh, well, there may have been, but they didn't rise to the top 15 is what I really looked at. So I don't have any information on that, but I would think that roadrunner like what I mentioned with Robin is, is a bird that wants open bare ground. It's looking for grasshoppers, lizards and other reptiles and uh, it, it probably didn't do very well. Um, so I don't have anything on roadrunners other than that. Okay, well, thank you. I think that's all the, oh, okay. We have one more question um, and then I'll let you go. Okay, what sort of bird seeds do you recommend for feeders? How often should I clean it? What can I do about squirrels? Huh. The birders dilemma, squirrels. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of people do like watching squirrels. Um, when my kids were little, they, I was looking at the birds and they were watching the squirrels. So they do make feeders that are squirrel proof. Um, they have triggers when the um, subject gets, is too heavy, um, like a squirrel, it, it shuts the, the door of the little port where the food is. So a little light cardinal and a light grackle won't trip it but a squirrel will so look into squirrel proof feeders as, as an option um i i i don't feed a whole lot i wait till seed feeders i'm i'm excluding hummingbird feeders so seed feeders we don't really start in our backyard until it gets really cold in december or january and then we stop sometime in first half of march and we just do black oil sunflower um, I know a lot of people like Niger and, um, uh, and really expensive seeds for their goldfinches and siskins. If you got the money, go for it. I don't recommend that the, the uh, mixed stuff that, that has all what I call filler, like millet, um, and just stuff that once you feed birds, you realize most of them aren't going to e even eat it. So I don't like those, those mixed seed. Uh, I, I stick to just pure black oil sunflower. That's, that's my, that's our go-to in our backyard. 
And was there, it was, oh, and there was a cleaning. Yeah, um, so what we recommend is taking the feeders down every few days and um, cleaning them with a 10% bleach solution, letting them dry before you put them back up. There, there's ways you can do this. You can buy everything in duplicate. So that means when you take down, you're putting up the, its twin immediately and you're working inside on the first one that you know might require a little scrubbing and a little drying. And some people don't wanna wait an hour. Um, uh, so, so that's an option too, but a 10% solution of bleach, nothing harsher than that. Um, your bird bath, same thing, let it sun dry before you, um, put more water in it to let it go. But if you, if you've done your bird bath, you, and you've seen birds congregate, you'll see what they do on the, on the rim and sometimes in the water, they poop. So that can be pretty bad. Um, so keeping these things clean is essential. 10% bleach solution will do it and let and make sure everything's dry before you uh, you mount remount these things, okay? All right, that the dual feeder idea is brilliant. I'm, I'm definitely going to use that. <laughs> yeah, and we do, we do that with our hummingbird feeder. We have two of everything and that way when we take one down, we're not feeling rushed and pressured to clean it and get it back up, we've already put the twin out and, and everything's yeah. good. So, yeah, and I mean, if you love birds and you wanna do this stuff, what's a few more bucks to buy another feeder? What's a few more bucks for the, the better seed? And if you, you gotta make the time to keep things clean. Um, otherwise we could be contributing to bird deaths and bird illnesses. And I think, I think in the next 10 years, we're gonna see some, some big changes, not for the better uh, when it comes to feeders, because I think we're starting to see that these artificial gatherings of birds are not going well for a lot of birds. It's uh, just, a, it's a, it, and, and everybody that went, has gone through COVID realizes you, you just can't go into movie theaters and get packed in an airplane um, until we get this, you know, until we got vaccinations, did we, were we able to really relax that for a little bit, but the same is true for birds. We can't expect these birds to get in close proximity and gather up in groups. And we look outside and we think, oh, look what I've done. I've created food and water and, and, and birds are healthy because of me. Well, one author coined uh, the title of his article really well. Um, of killing birds with kindness, killing birds with kindness. And so keep that in mind. If you're going to make the effort to feed birds, you got to do it right or don't do it at all. We say that with owning pets when we have children. It's no different. If you're going to jump into these things in your life, you got to do it right or go home. All right. Well, that's great advice. And with that, um, we can end things here. So we are recording this. We'll put it up on our website in the next couple of days. So thank you all so much for joining us for our first speaker series of the summer. Um, Cliff, thank you so much for giving such an educational talk. Thank um, you. I, I hope I'll see you all out on the trails very soon. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.